Return to Dallas, Spokane River, Spokane, Washington, July 19th, 1963. Not knowing your identity leaves a disconsolate, empty, pervading feeling that rips the soul. He sprinted toward a foggy glow that drew him forward as a powerful wind whipped back his hair. His eyes watered. More shots now popped in rapid succession but the fog and the fields within the tunnel somehow diverted the bullets. Why were they shooting at him? A vague form followed him on the grid behind. Then he heard someone bellowing his name and another person screaming, don't get trapped. He fought against the onslaught, but another force brought his body upward like a plane, gaining lift. The ranting gave way to a cold, howling wind and light flashes. His stomach grew queasy as his body flew into the brightness. Light faded to dark, and a painful clashing hurt his ears as he was dragged into the thickening clouds of a swirling gaseous wave. A consistent revving blast like the acceleration of a rocket launcher on a desert track decreased in intensity as the mist slowly parted. He lay on a rocky slab overlooking an arched bridge in twilight. A wide waterfall cascaded through a concrete arch and formed a less ominous waterway below. He sat up under a few twinkling stars in the ink blue sky. A slight amber glow traced the horizon over the mountain trees. In the murkiness, the river crashed over the rocks into rivulets below. He sensed someone had chased him through a wild storm, but he didn't even know who was after him, nor could he recollect how he even got here. Even worse, he could not even say his own name or recall anything about the past. Silhouetted city buildings and incandescent lights shining in faceless windows formed a bright rim beyond the concrete bridge. A few slow-moving bulky cars chugged across the bridge. More prominent was a dark brick structure with a sign illuminated with green letters on the roof. Washington Water Power. State of Washington. He said, running his fingers on his light green jumpsuit. Where did I get this outfit? He pivoted on the cliffs and crawled up the surrounding fir tree slopes. The deafening falls followed him to the top where the bridge rail met the dirt road shoulder. He vaulted the rail onto the asphalt. His first inclination was to run across the bridge. An old two-tone blue rambler shifted by him as he trotted high above the river. Why can't I remember anything, he yelled, competing with the roar of the falls. He neared the brick power building but kept running. As he rounded the corner, he shouted out the name of the black and white street sign. West Spokane Falls Boulevard. I'm in Spokane, Washington. Okay, so what? West Spokane Falls Boulevard curved left. He pivoted onto West Sprague Avenue. He shook his head and made guttural noises in frustration as he tried to remember how he got to Spokane. He slowed up ahead at a looming bulky box of a building. He looked at the theater marquee. Steve McQueen, James Garner, The Great Escape. A green Chevy with a long trunk and a toffee-colored Ford Fairline passed him on West Sprague Ave. He paced at the traffic light and looked down behind him. Someone had been chasing him. He was sure of it. The young woman in a red uniform pushed back a mass of auburn hair as she watched him from the glow of a ticket booth window. He again checked behind him toward the bridge in the falls below. He then broke into a full sprint away from the theater. For blocks, he passed under tall globe street lamps, a blur of neon signs and well-lit storefronts. He fought to recall anything about himself and where he had come from. Near a pink neon drugstore sign and an RX symbol, he clutched onto the metal light pole. This is insane, he yelled, and several people near the drugstore turned. Why am I here? Hey, you all right, pal? Asked a man in a white shirt and tie. A neon sign for Union Station glowed at the end of the busy street. Maybe hopping a train would get him away from whoever was after him. Across the street, Bright white digits on the bank brightened in the night, 8 p.m. Large finned cars confounded him, yet somehow it all made sense to him. But he just did not know why. He thought about heading toward the hotel ahead, but instead reversed himself down the sidewalk. 
Ten minutes later, he was back at the square white building housing the Fox Theater. He breathed heavily and gripped a mailbox. The sunshine glow flared across the thin clouds above the darkened city buildings. A guy and his girl in a red and white Ford from the 1950s pulled up to the lights. Surf City, sung by Jan and Dean, rocked out of the open car window. He staggered and leaned against the silver light pole. The dark-haired woman in the ticket booth occasionally looked up from the book she was reading. He removed a folded piece of paper from his pocket. A photo of Dodger Stadium and a note below confused him. Contact information. Johnny Roselli, July 1963. Pittsburgh Pirates versus the Los Angeles Dodgers, July 25th, 1963, Dodger Stadium. Find him. You know the rest. He shook his head. He studied the man with a cocky grin. Who was Johnny Rosselli? Who wrote this? He folded the photo and placed it back in his pocket. This was not his time period. What had happened before he lay on the rocks above the river? The woman in a red uniform, maybe in her late 20s, smiled at him and then went back to reading her book. The gold tag on her blazer had a name in black letters. Shari. He inhaled again and then walked toward her away from the crosswalk. She pushed her hair back and smiled again, but her smile quickly collapsed. Can I help you, sir? She said through the rounded ticket opening in the glass. Then she tilted her head. Boy, do you look lost. She looked down at the book cover of someone drawing a coat of arms with a blue pencil. Then she bookmarked her place with a foil piece of juicy fruit gum. Ian Fleming, James Bond, at least I remember him. He just started it tonight. She had a smooth, almost melodic voice. Bond is resigning. He doesn't get himself killed first. Huh? She leaned forward and folded her hands. Her nails were unpainted, but she wore a lip frost. She smiled and produced a British accent. Well, if I cannot find Blofield, my dear M, I do believe I must resign. He surveyed the inside of the lobby. Oh, he'll find Blofield. And how do you know this, Mr. Know-it-all? I read the book, but I can't remember where I read it. I can't remember when I read it. What? She looked him over with more than just a cursory glance. I suppose you want to buy a ticket. I would if I had the money. The Great Escape was a good movie. Was? She straightened up, her white acrylic sweater accentuating her breasts. You must have already seen it. What was that? She had a slight smirk. Then she called out and cupped her hand as if he were hard of hearing. I said you must really like the movie if you've already seen it. He pretended to smile as he looked at the booth's tiny calendar. How had he ended up in July of 1963? What day of July is it? July 19th. You have no money. You're wearing a jumpsuit. Did you escape from Walla Walla? He shook his head. I don't think so. She stood, opened the rear door, and walked around the booth. Her frame was slender and her legs long. He figured she was around five foot eight. She looked him up and down. My name is Sherry Thomas, she said, extending her hand. Her skin was smooth and warm. She wore a fresh scent. And you? Mr. Know-it-all. You want my opinion? He faked a smile. No. You're a government agent. He pressed his lips and shook his head because he remembered nothing about his life. I think you've read too many Bond books. Maybe. That's how I know. Now, Miss Thomas, you sound as if you're one of my students. What do you teach? I used to teach history, current affairs, and drama. I'm taking some time off. And it's Sherry. Shari. He kept her eyes locked on him. You look a little old to be a ticket girl. Ticket girl, she cackled. I've worked here since I was a freshman in high school. And I always work here during summer vacations, Mr. Know-it-all. And I'm taking courses for my master's degree. He liked her when he had no business liking anyone with his blank memory. Where do you go to school? Gonzaga University, right here in the city. Godzilla University. Oh, so you're a comedian, too. Gonzaga University is a fine Jesuit school. Can I get inside, Cherry? She seemed to like him calling her name. If you have a dollar, she unfolded the palm of her hand. Plus, the movie's almost over. You'd only catch the last half. I'm afraid I don't have any money.
I just need to get into the theater for a few minutes. Sherry put her hand on her hip and her brow furrowed. Let me get this straight. You have no money, you don't know your name, and you're dressed like some mental patient. Or prisoner. Right, right. So what's the problem? The problem is I could get fired. She swung her hips as she returned to the booth. He moved up to the window and placed his hands on the edge. What if I told you I fear for my life and need to get inside? She turned the bond book over, leaned forward and stared into his eyes. You're serious, aren't you? I don't know how I got to Spokane. I ought to have my head examined. She ripped a green ticket off the ticket roll. He could see she enjoyed her little performance as she slid the ticket toward him. She put her hand on his. One condition. What's that? You meet me outside here when you leave. Then she held up the book. I love spy novels. I'll catch you on the way out, he said, pulling out the ticket. If anyone's looking for me, I'm not here. Then he turned and snapped his finger. Moon. His name was Moon. I remember that. Oh, great. The man in the moon. He shrugged his shoulders and she smiled. You do have a problem. Once in the air-conditioned building, amidst the smell of freshly butted popcorn, he crossed the soft, flowery carpet. He handed his ticket to a bow-tied man in a blue suit with yellow buttons. Another man in an identical uniform escorted him up the staircase to the second floor. He opened the theater door. A sloping balcony overlooked ornate Art Deco columns down the front. A man pointed a flashlight at the front seat and disappeared up the aisle. For the longest time, he closed his eyes and his heart beat out of control. A racing motorcycle on the screen broke his light sleep. He sat near the edge and leaned forward. There had to be a way to reason his way out of the situation, even if he knew nothing. Somebody had hypnotized him into forgetting major portions of his life, including his name. In the chilly air, he removed the folded photograph. The movie light illuminated this Johnny Rosselli smiling face at a Los Angeles game that was six days in the future. A soft fragrance mixed with juicy fruit preceded a hand on his shoulder as he turned. So, what's new? Sherry whispered. Want some gum? No, thank you. I thought you were working the ticket booth. Movie's basically done. So did you figure out who you are yet? No. Did Bond bail Tracy out of the casino? She squeezed his wrist. As a matter of fact, he did. You can remember Casino Royale, but you don't remember your own name. Nifty. Nifty? Then he fully turned. You're taking an inordinate interest in a total stranger. Hey, heck, a guy runs by me in a jumpsuit and then comes back and says he has no idea who he is. It's like being in the novel. I suppose so. Then her dark eyes opened so he could see the whites. How can you not know who you are? I think you just don't want to tell me. You like puzzles? She leaned on her folded hands on the back of the chair. Okay, what's the puzzle? He handed the Rosselli photo to her and positioned it so the movie light would make it visible. Contact information. Johnny Rosselli, July 1963, Pittsburgh Pirates versus the Los Angeles Dodgers, July 25th, 1963, Dodger Stadium. Find him. You know the rest. She stared for a second. How can this game between the Dodgers and the Pirates be photographed? It hasn't happened yet, they both said together. The lady in the front seat turned abruptly. Shh! And whoever wrote this wants you to meet this Rosselli, she whispered. Contact him. You know the rest. Well, do you know the rest? That's the problem. I don't know anything about this. Then you'll have to ask Rosselli. The photo must be from another game. Maybe there's a scoreboard, but that's all irrelevant. Why am I in Spokane? You're asking me? Yeah. She lifted her palm against her bangs. This is the strangest thing I've ever heard of. Sorry. He shook his head again. I'm thinking somebody doesn't want me to remember. In the words of Gomer Pyle, golly. Gomer Pyle? Come on, man with no name, she said, motioning him with her head. When they were on the mezzanine, he looked at her paperback. Did it ever occur to you, Miss Thomas, that whatever I'm involved in might not be safe? She produced the same perfect tooth smile. Of course. My car is parked out back. Return to Dallas, Chapter 2 
Fox Theater, Spokane, Washington, July 19th, 1963, 9.45 p.m. Just what are you studying at Godzilla U? Dinosaurs. Why did I think you'd say that? American Studies. They reach the parking lot. And just what can you do with a master's degree in American Studies? She pursed her lips. Probably what I'm doing now. He looked around. I honestly don't know where I am. Maybe I'll write a book or work to get Kennedy reelected. I can't see you cooped up in the ticket booth or other classroom. You've got me pegged, Mr. Nobody. I would work for Kennedy. Something about Kennedy made his stomach jittery. Wow. What's the matter? One of those feelings, like someone is chasing me or my mind is hypnotized. Kennedy. Jack Kennedy. What is it about Jack Kennedy? I don't know. Ask Mrs. Kennedy. She motioned him to a fire engine red Chevy Impala with a white convertible top. The wax paint had high gloss and the white walls glistened in the parking lot light. What year is this car? It's a year old. That's odd. Odd? She stopped again and put her hand on her hip. Where in God's name did you come from? He shrugged his shoulders. I don't know. She raised her brows and then turned toward her car. I bought this on the last day of school. I woke up and I thought I wanted a convertible, so I bought a convertible that afternoon. Look at all the chrome and the white wall tires. All cars have chrome, she said as she unlocked the side door. She walked around the hood and got behind the wheel. Still smells like a new car, because it is. She turned the key and the engine quickly cranked over. Then she leaned toward him. You want to put the top down? Why not? Thank you. The humming convertible top collapsed behind the back seat, revealing a slew of stars above the building. She backed the car in a semicircle. Then she pulled out to the traffic light in front of the theater. With the green light, she began a course past the neon storefront signs. The wind blew her thick hair back as they cruised through Spokane, Washington on a warm July evening in 1963. I have a feeling I've been in this time period before. You sound like a museum guide. This is so different, all these big cars. I think a lot of the downtowns disappeared. I feel like an idiot. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. Are you calling me an idiot, Smile Patch? I could, but you did that, Macbeth. She stopped at the light. I was one of the witches in Macbeth in high school. You a witch? I don't believe it. Her smile was different now. Look at the stores, Grants, Newberry. Things really did change. What are you saying? The odor of cigars from unknown smokers wafted down the sidewalk. He smelled food, all kinds of food. Then he thought about the stores. Things never stay the same. She nodded and turned up the radio. And as promised on AM 790, Elvis and the devil in disguise. I won't say anything about the devil in disguise because he's sitting right next to me. He rested his elbow on the window frame. Who, me? Disguised anyways. You want an ice cream? His face soury. If I had money. What's the last thing you remembered before you got here? Everything was like a storm, fog and wild wind. She opened her eyes as if she thought he was crazy. If we were in Seattle, I would say you were washed ashore in a storm. Maybe you were anyways and ended up here. It's not that far. Where are you from? Unknown. She began singing Devil in Disguise. I'm totally lost and laughing about it. I have that effect on people. I can see that. He looked down at the chrome-framed AM radio. The next song had a catchy tune, but with Japanese lyrics. Sukiyaki, I thought you said ice cream. Her sad and glassy eyes matched her shaky voice. We are getting ice cream. Sukiyaki is the name of the song. Are you okay? She wiped her eye quickly with a tissue. So let's get an ice cream, Mr. Man Without a Name. 
at the Benoit milk bottle. The what? You'll see. She slowed at the next light. I'm sorry somebody hurt you. Me too. She looped the Impala into a small parking lot with a huge white milk bottle rising into the night sky. You've got to be kidding. Would I kid you? If I had the money, I'd buy you a double scoop. And I would eat it. Come on in. My treat. Return to Dallas, Chapter 3 The Benoit Milk Bottle, Spokane, Washington, Friday, July 19, 1963, 10.17 p.m. Sherry handed both ice cream cones to him inside the open convertible. He wrapped the white paper napkins around the cones as the radio newscast began. President Kennedy today landed at Otis National Air Base on Cape Cod. There to meet the president at his helicopter was his son, two-and-a-half-year-old John Jr. He inhaled slowly and wondered why the mention of President Kennedy's name had him flummoxed. Sherry stared at him as she took her cone. What's the matter? You have that weird look on your face again. I don't know. The president was off to Hyannis, Massachusetts for the christening of his nephew, Christopher George Kennedy, son of Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and his wife, Ethel. Godmother of Christopher George was Mrs. Peter Lawford in a ceremony at St. Francis Xavier Church, officiated by Archbishop of Boston, Richard Cushing. He licked the double scoop vanilla. The memory loss heightened his senses. He slid the napkins up the cone to stop the melting ice cream. Sherry sunk her teeth into the sugar cone as the car engine ran. A human being today, for the first time, sustained life by means of an artificial heart pump. A team led by Michael E. DeBakey at the Methodist Hospital in Houston performed the procedure. Maybe they have an artificial brain. Sherry laughed and spilled the ice cream cone on her chin. He wiped it off with a napkin. I can't believe this. An hour ago, I'm in the ticket window, minding my own business. At the intersection of Market Street and Front Street in San Francisco, a 25-pound bomb was dropped by a U.S. Navy Reserve pilot on a routine exercise flight. She pointed at the radio and laughed. What's so funny? Now I know what you did. You bombed San Francisco. He shook his head and smiled. Then he bit into the cone. The Strategic Air Command reported no damage to the IBM building, but a secondary building a short distance away was damaged without any injuries. We'll see if he ever flies again. She chewed up the remainder of her cone. It's getting cooler. I'll put the top up in a second. Tell me, Miss Thomas, your family must live here in Spokane. Mom and Dad are retired in Hawaii. I'm still at the old homestead on East 10th. Only child? The one and only, my mother said, and I'm Daddy's little baby. You don't look like a baby, he said, nibbling at the rest of the cone. She pushed his arm in jest. Don't be throwing stones. You don't even know who you are. This is true. He took the last bite and wiped his mouth. Something caused him to turn around toward the light. Dr. Moon, in an identical green jumpsuit, stepped from a maroon and white Volkswagen bus. Like a gunslinger in the old west, he pointed a luger at the Impala. Oh my God! What's the matter now? Hello, Patch. Apparently your little diversion in the chamber will not work. You won't meet Mr. Rosselli or change anything. Patch? Asked Sherry, mouthing his name. Who's that? Dr. Alexander Moon. She stared at the Luga. Mamma mia. Moon stepped closer. I haven't decided if I'm going to kill you now or just wait until we snap back. Sherry had subtly shifted the car in reverse. Then she quickly pushed her foot to the floor. They accelerated in reverse so fast the tires screeched and dust billowed into the night sky. Moon stumbled back as she spun in a donut pattern around the lot and continued in reverse toward the traffic light. As she whipped the steering wheel around near the light, Moon fired the Luger several times. A bullet pierced the metal stop sign to the right as she sped away. Moon ran toward the Volkswagen bus. You have an odd choice of friends, Patch, old boy. He's no friend. That's encouraging. You need to call the cops. Who is that maniac? Dr. Moon. 
doctor? I think he escaped from the psych ward. She spun into a gas station and parked the car about 30 feet from the side bathroom. Pop the hood. Patch leaped out the door and lifted the hood up at an angle. Then he climbed back in the car. She shut off the engine. You like my driving? How'd you learn to drive like that? Her eyes moved from side to side. Oh, I just learned. And you don't know exactly who this madman is. The harder I try to remember, the more I forget. You've been hypnotized. Patch nodded. Right. I couldn't even remember my own name. She pointed toward the street as the Volkswagen bus approached the traffic light. There goes A.J. Foyt. Who? Forget it. Moon, leaning forward with the Luga stuck out the window, raced by the trees and cars. By now, sirens grew louder. Moments later, a police car, lights flashing, raced after the bus. Thank you, Spokane's finest. Patch exited the car and dropped the hood back in place. When they get him, he'll blame you. Good. Maybe then I can find out who I am. Toward midnight, they walked along the water just outside the college. The massive brick buildings and slate roofs surrounded a courtyard in the darkness. Some of the buildings still had a few lights on the inside, and the surrounding lamps in the parking lot brightened the asphalt and remaining automobiles. He guided her to a wood bench overlooking the water. How come you remember his name and nothing else? I know he was chasing me near the river. I came out in all this fog. She shook her head rapidly. This makes no sense. He wanted to kill you. I think he did. I just don't think you're leveling with me. He slowly turned. I really don't remember anything. Look, the radio said he was headed east toward Idaho. Then she folded her arms. What are you going to do now? He removed the folded paper with Rosselli's name on it. Somehow I need to get to Dodger Stadium in L.A. for the Pirates game on the 25th. I'll talk to this Rosselli and straighten this out. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Can I drop you off somewhere? Where? Hotel? I don't know. She took out her car keys. I'm going back home. Oh, I understand. She shook his hand. Well, I guess this is goodbye. Thanks for the ice cream. Don't mention it. She tilted her head and started back across the grass, but turned a few yards away in the dim light. Where did you get that picture and the note? They faced each other at a distance. I'm not sure. I think the computer spit it out. Computer? She rubbed the back of her neck and marched back to the bench. Computer? A baseball game that hasn't happened yet? A madman in a VW bus? So what's the problem? What's the problem? The problem is it's insane. She took her pocketbook off her arm and opened it. Then she wrote something down on a little piece of paper. Here, this is my number. Let me know how this turns out. Patch took the paper and nodded. Thanks again. You want my opinion? She asked as she started back. Patch did not answer. Try one of the churches. Hide in there until they arrest Moon. This time she crossed the field and the Impala started a few moments later. Patch held the paper as she looped around the lot. The red Impala then disappeared up a campus side street. He tucked her number inside his jumpsuit pocket. Under the streetlight, he studied the picture of Rosselli at Dodger Stadium. He concentrated, but something blocked his recollection. Unsure of just what he would do, he backtracked to the parking lot. Moon must have had the same black and white note. He walked quickly, but stopped where the Impala had been parked. The city lights glowed even at this late hour. Heading into the city would give him options as to where he could spend the night. He slowly smiled as he pictured her, ice cream cone in hand, as she laughed. He left the lot and walked down the sidewalk just outside of town. Again he smiled when he thought of her singing the Elvis song, and he wondered just who had hurt her. He searched the skyline for church steeples as he walked. Behind him, headlights exaggerated his shadow on the road. He looked to his left as a car approached. The Impala's top was up. Sherry pointed toward the passenger side. Okay, get in. I don't understand. I ought to have my head examined. You can sleep on the porch couch, Patch. I can call the police about Moon, and then you can see what you're going to do in the morning. 
Patch leaned on the window frame. Are you sure? She raised her brows and pointed at the seat. Patch opened the door and got in. She pulled away from the curb. You weren't really going to leave me out there, were you? Yes, she said, and then she leaned forward on the wheel. Well, at least until I got to Main Street, and then I tried to figure all this out. And you figured it out in five minutes? No. I'm just afraid your Dr. Moonlight Bay will come back and use you for target practice, whether it's here or in L.A. Well, I'm grateful. She turned into a drive next to a two-story White House with a glassed-in porch. Then she shut off the car. What did Moon mean when he said, wait until we snap back? Maybe he owns a slingshot company. Oh, funny, Patch, she said as they got out of the car. Aren't you a little bit curious why Moon had a gun pointed at you? Sure I am. He followed her to the side door. And pointed at me also, I might add. I'll find out when the cops track him down. She still hadn't opened the door. Let me tell you something. Moon was traveling east. If he heads into the mountains, it could take weeks before they find him. Or he could just slip away. Let's hope they get him tonight. She looked him over. You are the coolest guy I ever met, and I don't mean it like that. You seem unfazed. I'll work it out. That's what I mean. Listen to you, Patch. No memory, no money, and it doesn't seem to bother you. I think your government. What, an agent? Yeah. She unlocked the door and then opened it. She flipped on the kitchen light. You want my opinion, he asked. She smiled at his imitation of her. What's your opinion? Time to get some shut-eye. 16 East 10th Street, Spokane, Washington, Saturday, July 20th, 1963, 6.45 a.m. Thanks for the breakfast, he said, pushing his plate forward. Can I help you with the dishes? She hadn't said much since he walked inside from the porch about an hour ago. I'll take care of him, she said as she yawned. Did you sleep? Oh, sure. I spent all night trying to figure out who and what you are. I thought I heard you scream. Oh, I had a nightmare. Oh, no, she said as she sat down beside him. What was it about? Not important. Sure it is. You might be trying to remember something. Patch rubbed his chin. Well, I was out on the prairie. I could see for 20, maybe 50 miles. In the distance there are these gray clouds extending up to tremendous heights. And a car. Car? A long, dark car down the sloping highway heading toward the gray, towering clouds. Her dark eyes focused on him. Do you think you were out on the prairie before? I don't know. Sherry turned on the portable TV next to the refrigerator. So what do we do now? We? She watched the TV closely. The local news is coming up. We will find out what happened to your Dr. Moon. Patch removed the folded paper from his jumpsuit. He shook his head. I don't understand this. May I see that photo or whatever it is? Patch nodded and handed the paper to her. He watched the Q6 local newsman, but he doubted if the moon story would even make the newscast. This is strange. What do you mean? I've never seen a clear photograph on regular paper. And how was that note printed on the paper? Patch looked up from the TV. The main thing, Sherry, is the date. It says next Thursday. This is some kind of joke. Look at the scoreboard. She held up the paper. July 25th, 1963. See? Well, anyone would realize you're the victim of some practical joke. Or if I'm government, as you say, maybe it's code. I need to get to Los Angeles by next Thursday and find out exactly what this is all about. Good luck she said, drying another dish. Now from KHQ News. Reporting on last night's bizarre shooting near the Benoit milk bottle is Wallace Davis. Wallace? A younger man in a light sport coat held up a copy in his hand. Thank you, Dave. Police are confused by the disappearance of a stolen van and the subsequent shooting at the milk bottle. The driver of the van, who was shouting, held his gun out the window as he raced away from the scene. Police later sighted the van east and off the state highways. As of right now, the van has eluded the police in the mountains. Well, at least they didn't mention your car. 
good. I really don't want to explain this thing because I can't explain it. Sorry. She nodded and put away the other dishes. Look, this is a second bath upstairs. You need a shower. Thanks a lot. You know what I mean. He nodded and stopped. And Patch? Yes, he said without facing her. I made a decision last night during my tossing and turning. What was that? I'll bring you to the Oregon border if that helps you get to L.A. Patch turned around. You don't have to do that. This is true, she said, taking a pack of juicy fruit gum out of the cabinet. He moved up next to her. She came up to his Adam's apple. She produced a large grin. You know, this is the wackiest thing I've ever heard of. I'm hoping that between here and Astoria, I can figure out this game. Return to Dallas, Chapter 4 U.S. Route 395, Mesa, Oregon, July 20th, 1963, 10.30 a.m. A never-ending spread of evergreen trees covered the hills and mountains. She kept the top up as they headed south toward Oregon. Occasionally a log-hauling truck, or more often a car, whizzed by. The land remained isolated and somewhat lonely. I do think you remember everything. Oh, you do, do you? Well, do you? I don't. She held onto the wheel and shook her head. I don't think I'm going to understand this until I talk to this Roselli. She nodded as she brought the car around the bend. Maybe it was the remoteness of the land that left him fearful about Moon. Moon knew about Roselli on the 25th. He constantly checked the side mirror for the Volkswagen bus. While you were in the shower, I called Bill Slauson down at the police station. Bill told me the cops chased Moon off the road like the report said, but they lost him in the mountains toward Coeur d'Alene. That's rough territory. At least we're heading south and he's lost in the hills. Sorry you got into whatever this is. Oh, I was having a dull summer. I need some excitement. Her hair moved with the breeze and around her red bandana. I'll go back and find Moon so he can fire a few more shots at us. She tried not to laugh. Her cheeks moved as she grinded her teeth, but then she broke into a laugh. She kept smiling as she alternated glances at him down the highway. I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. That wasn't funny, she said, admitting another burst. Who the hell are you, Patch? Who do you think I am? Sherry squinted and looked down the winding highway. It's that photo on the paper that has me stymied. My gut feeling is that your government, that Moon knows why somebody died, and that's obviously why he's so colossally annoyed with you. So what does that add up to? Sweetness, I have no idea. He watched her as she took the mountain turns. Then he looked in the side mirror again. Where did you learn to drive like that? You know just when to bank. Actually, I'm an expert driver. I've reached 140 on the track. He nodded his head so quick it looked as if he had a tick. Then he checked the speedometer. As he sat back in a comfortable position in the seat, a prodigious snow-capped mountain towered over the distant ridges. What's that? Mount Hood. Mount Huge? Hood. You really went up to 140? Once, Ricky liked to race cars. Then she hit her forehead with the butt of her hand. Okay, his name was Ricky. She immediately twisted on the radio and said nothing right through the newscast. Put on your smoke glasses today and get ready for darkness. Today's total eclipse of the sun should be quite stunning in the northwest area. We'll be getting live reports from the area during the eclipse. Think about what happened to you, Patch. Were you in the mountains? Things can change with the blink of an eye, even up here in summer. I know, I've hiked hood. Don't remember anything about the mountains. What did Moon mean when he mentioned snapping back? Don't know about that either. You sure you didn't bomb San Francisco yesterday and just running up here to escape? Patch raised his index finger. Did I shake something loose? I think I have flown jets. Now we're getting somewhere. Your name is Patch and you fly jets. And this Dr. Moon was chasing you with the intent to kill. He looked in the side mirror again. He would have killed me last night. I know that. And he'll try again. First of all, he has no idea we left Spokane. So why would he chase us now? Because he knows you're headed to Dodger Stadium. He even has the date. Patch removed the photo of Dodger Stadium. You're right. I know that. 
You need to call that guy Slauson. If they have Moon in custody, then I have nothing to worry about. The Impala hummed along the Columbia River as the mighty waterway expanded to the Pacific Ocean. With a loud pop and subsequent thumping, the front end swung to the right. She rolled to a stop and Patch opened the door. Is it a flat? Looks like you ran over something. She leaned out the window and rested her head in her hands. Why, thank you, Patchy, for that technical report. Give me your keys, I'll change it. Patch stood up with his hands on his hips. She threw the keys to him. Patch remained nervous about Moon as he removed the jack from the spare tire in the trunk. He loosened the lug nuts with the wrench and then jacked up the car. Put on your emergency, it's on. She got out of the car as he finished spinning off the lug nuts. Hey, nice work for a man who remembers nothing. You know, he said, slipping off the tire. She helped him pull it off the rim. You're going to get your hands dirty. Patch, yes, he said as he lifted the other tire on. Would you mind if we get the tire plugged in the garage? I was going to suggest that. You need a good tire driving back to Spokane. And, he said, spinning the lug nuts, I will compensate you for the gas. A gradual smile edged up her cheek. Sure you will. The crusty old mechanic at the service station had a sour face and a rotten disposition. With an unsympathetic tone, he grumbled about not being able to plug the tire for a few hours. Rather than search around, they agreed to wait. She pointed at a brown-tinted spiral tower atop the Jason Hill. My parents brought me down here when I was a kid. It's called the Astoria Column. I ran to the top back then. Well, you're welcome to try again. She smiled and then broke into a run. Patch remained right behind her, up all 164 steps to the observation area. She breathed so quickly she had to steady herself on the stairway opening. Patch gave a few quick breaths and then walked onto the observation deck. The widening blue river created a majestic course between the trees and hills to the sea. Hey, she said, catching her breath, how come you're not winded? Should I be? <laughs> running up this column is no easy feat. She moved around him, all the while looking at his face. You are in the service of the government. What are you going to do once we get the car? Hitchhike and beg for food? The transforming thin clouds passed high above the tower. They both leaned on the retaining wall at the same time. If I'm a pilot, maybe I've been brainwashed for a reason. I keep thinking of how you reacted when I mentioned the president. Your government, I know you are. No, it's something more than that when I think about Kennedy. What has the president done that would make me feel this anxiety? Well, how about the fact the world was almost blown up last fall over the missiles in Cuba? Cuba? I get the same uncertainty of both Cuba and Rosselli. She pressed her lips and looked back toward the river. Is it getting dark or is it me? Radio mentioned in an eclipse. That's right. You know, as far as Kennedy goes, I never thought much about him being a great leader until after the missile crisis. Just last month, he gave this inspiring speech in West Berlin. He just didn't offer the people of West Berlin hope against the Russians. He spoke to the whole world. Ich bin ein Berliner. What does that mean? I thought it meant I am a Berliner, but somebody wrote in the paper it had another meaning. I am a jelly donut. But they all went wild in West Berlin anyway. Patch laughed and his face tightened. I think Kennedy has the potential to be a great leader, but I sense something isn't right. You want my opinion? He smiled. Do I have a choice? No, she said, pushing her finger into his ribs. You and Moon are involved in some kind of intelligence operation. Maybe you're afraid Kennedy will catch you. Somebody made me forget relevant portions of my life, and when I try to remember, it only gets worse. She looked upward as a few lights had popped on along the river. It's getting darker. No, no, don't look up. Why? The UVs will damage your sight. Okay, Mr. Know-it-all, what's a UV? The land and the river had darkened, almost like early evening now. Ultraviolet rays burned the retina and caused cataracts. It makes sense. The ancient Greeks believed that the gods were upset when there was an eclipse. They thought of it as a bad portent. What do you think? I think it's dark, he said, and they both laughed. Patch watched the land transform as the moon transited the sun. He concentrated on his own predicament. 
someone, by use of a printed photo on paper and a printed handwritten note, drew him to a Dodger stadium like a massive magnetic field attracting a piece of metal. The result never varied. Patch, you may not be safe at that game, or I'll meet an important contact. Again, whoever wrote that note was not aware that you had lost your memory. He nodded his head. You just love mysteries, don't you? I'm intrigued by mysteries. She stretched and checked her watch. And Moon is the rogue element. Not only does he not want you in L.A., he wants me dead. Until we snap back. So you're both from and maybe going to some place with fog and wind. And then I think you were dumped on those rocks by someone in a long car. Here's the important part of the note. You know the rest, Patch. No offense, but you don't know anything. Maybe I will if I meet Rosselli. Possible. Anyway, let's get back to the garage and see if Grumpy is ready to demonstrate his expertise in sticking a plug into a tire. Patch grinned. Sherry, you have a gift for descriptive language. Why, thank you, Patchy. Let's descend the tower slowly. The tire, freshly plugged, leaned against the garage door frame. The old man wiped his hands with a gray rag and rang up the register. Thanks, said Patch. He lit a cigarette. Don't mention it. Patch rolled the tire out to the open trunk. Sherry exited the car as he hoisted it back in place in the trunk well. Patch, I'm going to make a phone call back to Bill at the station in Spokane. Find out about Moon. That's nice of you. Thanks. I'll be right back. Patch glanced at her green caprice as she scurried over to the phone near the road. He smiled and then secured the jack and wing nut in place. Again he looked up. She had a little nose and her dark hair fluttered in the wind. In ten minutes, he would be hitchhiking south to Northern California. He would miss her laugh and the way she worded things. She used her hands as she spoke on the phone. He grinned again and shut the trunk. The traffic passed sporadically on the state highway. Maybe she would have good news from up north and Moon would be behind bars. She put down the phone and held her temples. Patch removed the change from a ten dollar bill and had it ready for her when she approached. What did you hear? I didn't talk to Bill. The van was abandoned at the state highway, but there's a ranger vehicle missing. He could be coming after you. Park truck will stand out. He'll ditch the truck. I'm banking they'll get him. Patch, you have no money. Keep that change. She turned slightly and was about to speak. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do want your opinion. Good, you read my mind. That mental case moon is heading south right now in another car or truck after you. And if he doesn't plug you along the way, he'll kill you at the game. My mission right now is to get to Rosselli. Mission? Listen to you. So be it. You haven't got a chance. You're going to step out there with no money and Moon Man coming after you. And you're just going to show up at that game and voila, the world becomes right again. You don't even know what's waiting for you there. So what's the problem? It really doesn't phase you, does it, Patch? You just assume you'll get there and everything will be fine. You have to be government. She turned and looked toward the river. What do you suggest? She kept her back toward him. Then she said something inaudible. What was that? I said I can get you to L.A. in less than 24 hours. Impossible. At 140? If I have to. I'll get you to L.A. and you can settle up with me later in Spokane. Let me think about it. Patch, I'm giving you a ride to L.A. Patch walked up to her. He looked into her dark eyes. I meant, I need to think about this. If Moon is heading south, he'll be on the main roads. Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, we could hug the coast. It would take longer. But you need to get to that game before Moon gets there. I'll pay you back, Sherry. She looked up slowly and was as serious as he had seen her. You do know you're in danger, Patch. I need to find out what this is all about. Return to Dallas, Chapter 5 Ventura Freeway, Los Angeles, California Wednesday, July 24, 1963 3.53 p.m. She had driven all night from the garage on the Argonne border into California. 
patch drove most of the way to San Francisco. On a long distance call at a hotel south of the city, she learned Moon had left the Spokane area. There were reports of him driving a 1961 Ford Falcon in Northern California. As they had at the San Francisco Hotel, they took separate rooms in Soledad, but they sat at a bar engaged in superficial talk past midnight. He remembered nothing about his life, and she kept Ricky hidden away in her deepest thoughts. When Patch dreamed that night, the dream was subtle, no nightmare. He was working at a table in front of a red brick building and other city buildings. Ahead was a road and a park with green grass surrounded by concrete barriers. He believed that people were spying on him as tourists wandered around the park and up a set of concrete stairs to a stockade fence on a small hill. He woke up and then they were off to L.A., but he thought about the dream before telling Sherry. The wind spewed through the open window, tempering the California heat. All the way from Camarillo, Patch had steered the Impala in and out of the steady Ventura freeway traffic. The top was still up. Okay, do you want to hear about my dream last night? You mean the long car on the prairie? She asked from the passenger seat. No, this wasn't a bad dream. I was working at a table in a park. Tourists were all around. And behind me was a box-like red brick building and other buildings in a city. Where? Had you been there before? Yeah, I feel as if I worked there. Any road signs or city signs? She asked, leaning toward him. No. She put her hand on his wrist. Patchy, I do think you'll get to the bottom of this. A thin pewter smog layer separated the valley from Los Angeles below and the prodigious mountain range to the north. I got Encino, I got Sherman Oaks, she said as she continued down the freeway. I got Van Nuys, she raised her hands in the air. And the Santa Monica Mountains, whoopee! You've really never been to LA? No, Patchy, never been to the land of make-believe. She checked the map. We're near Revue Studios, a.k.a. Universal. The Los Angeles Times spread over Sherry's folded legs in the passenger seat, flipped at the edges. She snapped her gum. Juicy fruit masked the ozone remnants in the air. You're not going to believe this. Try me. She paused, chewing. The Dodgers' right fielder is named Wally Moon. Come on. I'm telling you, Patch, it's right here in the paper. You got two hits yesterday in the game. It's that eclipse. Everything is wacky. She flipped over the folded paper and looked up. The Chinese used to execute their astrologers if they didn't properly predict an eclipse. But just add that to the list. Drysdale pitches tomorrow. I know this Roselli character is here on Thursday without Alexander Moon. She kept reading the article as she resumed chewing. What does it say? Oh, Koufax is pitching. He's already won 16 games. Patch maneuvered the Impala into the inside lane. The high mountain barrier seemed to hold the smog to the Pacific. Koufax, I know he's a good player, but you can't remember. Exactly. You want my opinion? No. My opinion is we should go to the game today on the off chance Roselli baby is there. She snapped the gum again. If we don't see him, then keep one step ahead of Moon. Exactly. Patch checked the clock at the top of the hour and turned on the radio. He twisted the dial, producing a modulating signal. Then he found a station. A few commercials preceded the news. You're listening to the new ABC, KABC, Los Angeles. News at 4 o'clock. At the White House, President Kennedy welcomed a group of American high school students, part of the Boys Nation. Each year, a gathering of aspiring citizens meet with the President in an event sponsored by the American Legion. In sports, Monday's heavyweight title defense, champ Sonny Liston took four seconds longer to knock challenger Floyd Patterson to the canvas in a Las Vegas, Nevada bout. Patterson fell in two minutes and six seconds last September and two minutes and ten seconds Monday night. Can anyone beat Liston? Entertainment news. England's group sensation called The Beatles released an album on a minor record label, VJ Records, this week. It's doubted that the group will reach the near frenzy reaction of the fans back in Great Britain. Patch twisted the dial. An Australian accented song about a kangaroo had him staring at the radio. 
As he started to change the channel, she held his wrist. No, wait, I like that song, she said. Timey kangaroo down sport? He made a sour face, and she laughed. Come on, Patch, I could dance to this song. Like a kangaroo. Patch clutched the galvanized fence that extended to the left field wall above the clay warning track and the brilliant green grass beyond. The crowd cheered as the Dodgers were about to beat the Pirates. Steamy frankfurters and popcorn made him hungry. Most of the cigar smoke wafted out of the stands. Some of the fans were already exiting the stadium through the tunnels. He had Rosselli's location figured out by lining up the folded photo. Tomorrow, Rosselli would be between the 15th and 16th rows near the fence aisle. He aimed the binoculars to deep center field. The seats aligned exactly with the gold letters on the black scoreboard and the orange 76 gas sign. A sandy ravine and brown hills bordered Dodger Stadium in the distance. At least Moon is nowhere in sight. Good. You want a hot dog patch? Sure. We can get some food on the way out. The Dodgers have this one in the bag. We don't have Major League Baseball in Spokane. We have the Spokane Indians. Patch looked over the binoculars and raised his brows. Oh? They're part of the Dodgers organization. Triple-A baseball. My dad went to their games quite a bit. Maybe we can go to one of their games when we get back. What did your dad do? Dad and Mom were both teachers. They both get a good old pension. She taught the middle grades for 42 years. Dad was a principal. They aren't happy about my situation. She put her finger on his nose. I don't dare ask about your family. You can ask, he said, laughing as if he were coughing. He let the binoculars dangle. You're a government agent just pretending he doesn't know anything. He shook her hand. Allow me to introduce myself. Bond, James Bond. Where's your Bentley, James? I don't remember. She tilted her head back and laughed. Is that right? In for repairs. Gee, that's too bad. I know a garage up in Astoria. Patch glanced down as she nonchalantly put her arm around his back. Wally Moon scored a run in the fifth. Roseboro hit the line drive. I didn't think you were watching. We kept looking around the stands. Her arm remained around his back, but she moved it once she realized it. The crowd cheered as the batter lined out to the second baseman. Winning pitcher, Drysdale, she said. Well, we'll be back here same time, same station tomorrow. Let's get some chow. Patch stared at the scoreboard. Five to one Dodgers. It isn't going to change. He panned the ballpark one more time, beginning at the right field corner. When he reached the Dodgers dugout, he saw Rosselli standing with several well-dressed men. Rosselli, over there. She held his arm and turned. Where? Dodgers dugout, hanging out with the muckamucks. She lifted the binoculars. That's him, all right. I don't know how we're going to get down there, said Patch. She handed the binoculars back to him. He focused the zoom on the animated Rosselli. Why wait until tomorrow for Moon to arrive? I'm for that, said Patch. Let's give it a shot right now. Patch plowed around the remaining patrons and pushed his way down the ramp to the base of the stadium. Heading up the ramp that led to the dugout, he pivoted left and then sidetracked into the stadium. The Dodgers' dugout soon came into view, but he did not see Rosselli. The other two men in dark suits and another one in a white shirt still lingered near the dugout. Patch moved ahead of Sherry and darted between the fans toward the painted blue rail that separated the less expensive seats from the boxes. A tall man with a slightly receding hairline removed his sport coat. He had full shoulders, thin arms, and a serious face. Near the dugout was a short little blonde-haired man who argued with the two men hard enough to turn his face crimson. The tall man stomped over to the blonde guy. We don't need this ruckus. The blonde guy looked up and shook his head as he returned to the stands. The big man turned to Patch. Okay, pal, what do you want? I had a meeting with Mr. Rosselli. All right, he nodded and squinted. Johnny's inside the dugout with Koufax and Drysdale. Tell him Patch is back. Sherry moved next to him. I'll let Johnny know you're here. He took two steps and then spun around. Patch, right? Patch. Sherry hit his arm as the big guy stepped into the dugout. I can tell you, Patch, whoever you are, that you're one persistent son of a gun. 
Patch was about to speak when Rosselli, smiling, emerged up the dugout steps. He was clad in a silk shirt and an elegant royal blue suit with dark alligator shoes. Koufax, and then the taller Drysdale, shook his hand, and then Rosselli followed them into the dugout. Patch shrugged his shoulders. The tall man stepped over to the rail and opened the gate. I'm Paul Brock, Mr. Kincaid. He had a pressure-packed handshake. Mr. Rosselli would like you to join him on the field. He'll be back momentarily. Patch led Sherry onto the red clay. Kincaid, she said, looking pleased with herself. Patch Kincaid. Anything I can do for you two, you let me know. Thank you. Rosselli, wearing a fitted blue suit, moved up the dugout steps and diagonally toward Patch. He shook Patch's hand. For a brief time, Patch felt smothered in his sweet cologne. I've heard all sorts of wild stories about you coming from the government, boys. They said something happened at the dam, just like what happened in Miami. Patch hesitated before speaking, stunned that he was involved in some kind of intrigue. And there were government people talking about him. I received a note from somebody saying you'd be here today, Mr. Rosselli. They said tomorrow, but I thought I'd try today. Who told you I'd be here? Unsigned note. Well, maybe I won't show up tomorrow, then. Patch Kincaid, alive and in the flesh. He held Patch's forearm. My friends and I are alive because of you. Patch had no idea what he was talking about. This is my friend, Sherry Thomas. Mr. Rosselli? Miss Thomas, let me be the first to say that we'll always be grateful to your guy here. Well, he's not my... He motioned to Paul Brock. Paul, bring Patch and his lady up to Mr. Massey's suite. I have to make a call. Patch raised his brows and tried to figure out how he knew Rosselli. Thank you, Mr. Rosselli. You're a good American, Patch. Rosselli patted his upper arm and moved across the dugout. Brock motioned them down the dugout steps. Sherry leaned toward Patch and whispered in his ear, You're a VIP, Patch Kincaid. Return to Dallas, Chapter 6. Private Reception Area. Los Angeles Dodges, Los Angeles, California, Wednesday, July 24th, 1963, 7.11 p.m. Patch leaned against the glass. Besides seeing the playing field from high above the stadium, the buildings of Los Angeles pointed upward toward the tapering plain. Sherry held a sombrero mixed by the bartender. Patch's golden beer bubbled in a glass on the side table. A diverse group of characters formed the crux of a loud jazz-induced party. The Dodgers players marched in together as if they were part of a stage performance. Women in low-cut, tight dresses bounced around like errant pinballs in a fixed game. An unkempt large man with rounded eyes and a tan suit with a drinker's nose spun a handgun on a piece of yellow bond paper. He laughed as the crowd backed away and the gun pointed at Rosselli. The serious-faced Rosselli picked up the gun and tossed it to the man. Then he crumpled the paper and placed it on the waiter's silver tray. Put it away, Bill. Then he mixed with the party guests, shaking hands as he worked the crowd like a politician. Somebody brought a vodka over ice to him. He spoke with the drink in his left hand as he jested with the other hand. Bill stared at Patch for the longest time as he secured his gun in a holster strap until a woman in a red satin dress brought him a drink. Double martini, she said, but the glass was already at his lips. Double martini. Priscilla stepped up to Patch and Sherry. Don't worry about Bill. Bill swaggered near Rosselli. Time for dinner, my friend. Perinos answered Rosselli in a lower voice. Then what, John? Then we meet Friedman at the Friars Club. Bill nodded and wandered back into the crowd. Was that gun loaded? asked Sherry incredulously. He always carries a 38 detective special, fully loaded. Then he put his hand on Patch's shoulders. I just bet the people in the Dodgers organization, Massey's men, that I would sit in the regular seats just like any other fan. I'll donate it to one of their charities. Maybe they'll take your picture, said Patch. Rosselli's face flattened like a newly pressed coin at the stamping machine. No photos, Patch. Ever. Yes, sir. 
Anyway, I'm in the left field grandstands for Koufax's game tomorrow. Patch thought about the photo, shot long distance, still folded in his pocket. We were up there today. Right. Look, Patch, I just had a conversation here and on the phone. People you know send their warmest regards. Listen, I have something in mind for you. Really? Roselli put his arm fully around Patch and escorted him along the window. You know, young man, there comes a time, as you know very well, when your country needs you. Last fall, the Russians almost brought us to the brink in Cuba. They want to take us over, Patch. That would not be good. See? You know what I mean. And I'm sure your new girl there knows, too. Sure. The parties to be, my friend, want you for an assignment. You mean work for you? No, not for me. A word to the wise. Stay away from Phillips, Hunt, and the intelligence boys. I'll let you know which individuals you can trust. If this works out, you'll be well taken care of. Bill moved with a certain swagger and transported a new drink out of the room. Patch looked back at Rosselli. Thank you. No, thank you. You'll have a main contact. Rosselli took a sip of the vodka and then the ice rattled in the glass. They'll pay you 2000 if this goes forward. 2000 You do what your contact says. This is on a need-to-know basis. Again, don't talk to any government types. Don't ask any questions. Be as discreet and as ballsy as you've been in the past, and you'll have a nice little cash for you and your girl. He leaned toward Patch. Patch, you look older. I've been through a lot. Sure. Prison will do that to you. Louis McWillie is the pit boss at the Thunderbird in Vegas. You drive to the Thunderbird tomorrow. After 10 p.m. tomorrow, specifically ask for McWillie. Tell them Johnny sent you. Your first contact is already in Vegas as we speak. Mr. Rosselli, I don't know what to say. How about yes? Sure, I mean yes. Here's what you need to do first. I want you to head out to the Santa Anita racetrack in Arcadia tonight. You'll need to be at window four at 9.30 p.m. My friend Walter the Knife will be there. Just don't call him Walter the Knife to his face. What do I call him? You call him Mr. Piscotti or Walter? Patch nodded. He has a manila envelope for you. Two grand will get you going, Patch. We owe you more than that, believe me, after what you did. Walter will give you my private number. If anybody tries to muscle you, you get in touch with me right away and we'll take care of the problem. I mean it. He handed Patch a card. Thank you. Everyone likes you and has confidence in your abilities, Patch. Do a good job. I will. I know you will. I know you can carry the load. Good luck. Roselli's eyes brightened as he squeezed Patch's hand. Then he went over to Sherry and shook her hand. He exchanged a few niceties and then left the suite. Patch held the card as he looked into her dark eyes. I'm heading to the racetrack and then to Vegas. She pursed her lips. Roselli told me they had 2,000 waiting for me at the racetrack and more to come. What did you do? kill somebody? Apparently I did something for him and his friends in the past. So I guess I'm going to pay you back, Miss Thomas. I guess so. And you should head back to Spokane. How will you get to Vegas? Bus? Plane? I have to meet this McWillie at the Thunderbird in Vegas. She reached the outside lobby doors. Look, Patch, I can bring you to Vegas. It's on the way and I can head north after that. You want my opinion? He asked with a smile mixed with uncertainty. Her eyes moistened. What's your opinion? This is really dangerous stuff. They're paying me all this money and I have no idea why. We'll get a hotel somewhere on the way to Vegas and then you can head back to Spokane. Santa Anita Racetrack, Arcadia, California, July 24th, 1963, 10.22 p.m. She held his hand at the fence surrounding a fountain. A huge green pavilion, lengthy and several stories high, was highlighted by powerful spotlights. The flags along the roof blended into the night. He repeatedly checked the parking lot, even though he knew Moon could never know his whereabouts. A variety of casually dressed people darted around the noise-filled park. Aromas of food and cigarette smoke drifted into the lot as they walked toward the entrance. As they entered the grandstand, the race board's white digits blazed across the dirt track. He checked his watch. 
We still have a few minutes before we meet Walter the Knife, she said. Oh, just don't call him Walter the Knife. Who, me? She smiled as they moved along with the animated crowd, but they did not sit down. He picked up the gold framed Santa Anita program. On the cover was a man standing next to a horse in a fox hunt. Official program. You better wait till you get your 2,000 before you play the ponies. Patch grinned and looked at his watch again. Let's head down to the windows in Mr. Piscotti. A few minutes later, a short man with receding dark hair and black glasses stood near the fourth window. He wore a pinstripe, double-breasted navy suit and a red silk tie. When he spotted them, he motioned them with his head. Then he actually exited the pavilion. Walter the Knife waddled over to a magnificent, shiny new black Cadillac and got inside. The side door opened and Sherry slid across the smooth leather ahead of Patch. The car had chrome molding and an elegant flare inside. Walter the Knife shook hands with Patch. He had a slight Italian accent. Walter Piscotti, pleased to meet you both. He reached into his back pocket and removed a bankroll of bills the size of a softball. A wood-handled revolver sat in a brown leather holster inside his open suit coat. One by one, he unfolded 20 $100 bills. He put the roll back in his pocket and fanned the 2000 Then he slapped it into Patch's hands. Thank you. You know, I never had good luck at the track on a Wednesday or a Tuesday or Monday. I can make the money, but I can spend it, too. Yes, sir. You and your lady, you have a good time. Place a bet for me in Vegas. I will, Mr. Piscotti. Johnny's uh, other number, 913-1915. You got that? Sherry finished writing on an envelope from her leather bag. Got it. Don't got it. Memorize it, he said, taking the envelope. I have it, said Patch. The man with a golden memory, added Sherry. Patch squinted at her, but a slight smile moved up his face. I'm going to try one more race. What do you think? He asked Sherry, squeezing her wrists. Sounds good to me. I hope you win. I never win. Walter the Knife again laughed heartily and opened the driver's door. Patch exited with Sherry out the side door. Walter the Knife raised his index finger. He likes you. Oh, he does, does he? Walter the Knife lightly tapped Patch's neck as he nodded. You, treat her good. He shook Patch's hand again, and then they headed along the fountain back toward the entrance. Did you see that bankroll, Patch? He held up the hundred-dollar bills. Chump change for Walter the Knife. They backtrack across the lot to the Impala. I don't have in the bank what he carries in his pocket. Man sounded as if we were going to get married. Slight problem, sweetness. What's that? I am married. Return to Dallas, Chapter 7. Inland Motel, San Bernardino, California. Thursday, July 25th, 1963. 12.01 a.m. The dream repeated. Up ahead, on the roadway, a dark car with several people inside accelerated toward the horizon. Patch ran at full speed, but he eventually slowed when the car blended into the gathering storm cloud. Gunshots popped from many directions, and then he woke up. He wiped the sweat off his forehead with the tissue from the bedside table. His heart continued to race. The drive from Oregon left him fatigue, yet the fright of the gunshots now kept him awake. He retrieved his pants off the chair and threw on the jacket he had bought along the way. With great dexterity, he opened the door slider so slowly as to not wake Sherry in the next room. When he stepped into the cooler balcony air, he saw three men standing next to a white station wagon partially covered by parking lot bushes. He saw her sitting alone on the wooden porch swing about 50 feet away. She had her legs crossed in Indian style and gently swayed with the night breeze. He walked deliberately, banging his bare feet on the redwood slats. In the yellow balcony light, she slowly looked up as he approached. Dried tears boarded her puffy eyes. Patch, I didn't know you had left your room. Are you all right? She wiped her eyes and looked over the lights across the sloping countryside. What brings you out here this time of night? I couldn't sleep. She nodded. I know what you mean. 
Several crumpled, juicy fruit wrappers had fallen through the redwood slats. He was not sure what happened to the gum. You'd think people would shut off lights by now. Sometimes I think the whole world never shuts down. It's all in your head. He sat next to her. The toes on her right foot pressed against his leg. Think about it. The world goes on, whether we want it to or not. Even when we're dead, we're not even a blip. Just another day or night, another mile on the highway. God, with that slant on it, I don't feel too bad now. What's the matter? Oh, Patch, you, you really don't want to know. How do you know that? She looked at him in the indirect light and smiled. Maybe I don't. You want your gas money, but are afraid to ask. Not even close. Her face contorted into a massive pout for just a second. Then she turned to him. You ever hear of Ricky Blaze? Can't say that I have, but then again my memory banks ain't what they used to be. She nodded in big nods. The swing started moving again. Well, Patch, my friend, Ricky Blaze is somewhere around Chicago and is probably going strong. Ricky Blaze is like one of those big 18-wheelers you see pass by on the state highway. Nobody sees anything from inside the cab, but if you're some critter crossing the road, or even a little caterpillar, you know when the 18-wheeler has run you down. What's his claim to fame? Oh, he certainly has a claim to fame. She swatted her hand through the night air. Ah, you don't want to hear this. Patch reached over and cupped his hand under her chin. Some of the tears had not dried. If I didn't want to hear it, I wouldn't be sitting out here after midnight. Her lips slowly spread with a smile that had neither happiness nor joy, more toward comfort as if she needed to tell the story. August 1961. Started out drizzly and they threatened to close down the annual picnic in the park. I wish they had. She looked forward across the spread of lights. My friend Vivian and I, wouldn't you know we went there to, you know, see the selection. You mean pick up guys. Okay, she said, raising her right hand. I plead guilty, Your Honor. Somebody you knew? Never met him. Never saw him before that night. The poster read, Ricky Blaze and the Hornets on stage one day only. Rock and roll in the tradition of Buddy Holly and Jerry Lee. You fell for a rock and roller. Yes, sir. Ricky Vitalis, that's what they called him, or the Blazer. He had, or I should say does have, a tremendously smooth voice. The reference to Holly on the poster was pretty accurate. So he ran up on stage and, right, she said with a half smile, Vivian and I watched the show just like everyone else. Then he looked down at me. You know how they look down at all the women while they're performing? Right. The show ended and we went over with people we knew in town. I actually was munching on a hot dog and talking with some of my students. Ricky walked by near the tables. He does a double take and then winks at me. That's original. I saw him about an hour later when this Negro group called the auditions were on stage. Nice slow stuff. Ricky bumps into me and asks me to dance. I, of course, am totally flattered. This man, I have to say, swept me off my feet. How did that happen? I'm still trying to figure that out. I know I was 28 years old and hadn't married. Not that I didn't have the opportunity. I date pretty regularly. But this guy was cool. Very, very well spoken. He said he went to law school, which was a lie. He said he had never been married, which was a lie. He left high school in his junior year. He had been in six bands. He smoked marijuana and always had a can of beer in his hand. Sherry, he said, putting his hand on her wrist. You're a bright girl. Bright has nothing to do with it. Guess not. It's me, Patch me, who broke out and allowed this guy to let me break out. Did I need to break out? I'm beginning to think not. That's my problem as I see it. Let somebody else take the responsibility for leading me down the primrose path. Patch looked out over the lights again. So what happened? I should have left Spokane when I found Mr. Fork Tongue in bed with two cuties at the Portland show. See, I wasn't going to be there, but I got another teacher to cover for me on a weekend chaperone trip. I showed up at his hotel room. He's right in the middle of, you found out. It hurt. But now you've got to get out of whatever mess you got yourself into. Well, I got out, but not after a year and a half of 
drunken reefer parties, hints of other women coming up and putting their paws all over Ricky. She pinched the bridge of her nose and started crying again. Sorry, I didn't mean to dredge all this up. Her eyes washed away the spontaneity. Aren't you going to ask why I married him? Hey, because we're all so boozed up, Patch. I didn't know till the next morning. It was like waking up with a 300-pound weight all around you. What a screw-up. He wiped the tears from her cheeks with his finger. She slid her shoulder against his shoulder and just held his hand. Then he finally spoke up. What is it you really want to do with your life, Sherry? Her voice had melded into a squeaky weakness of the woman he had met at the theater. It's all right there, Patch. Go forward with what I want because it's what I want. Take responsibility for it. Oh, I put on a good front. You mean teaching? Well, that, that's one thing. Sure, my parents were teachers. I'm a teacher. Not that I don't like to teach. Her voice trailed off, and soon her eyelids drooped. Leaning against his shoulder, she fell into a deeper sleep. The men in the white car near the bushes had left. With his left hand, Patch slid the blanket across the swing. He tucked it securely around her, letting her remain against his shoulder. Then he brought his other arm around her and closed his eyes. Inland Motel, San Bernardino, California, Thursday, July 25th, 1963, 6.35 a.m. At first, he didn't know where he was. The sun's rays pried open his eyes. Warm brightness obliterated everything else. He made his hand into a visor and the three-way conveyor belt of cars and trucks, mostly in a westward direction, came into a shaded view. A combined low-pitch hum was detectable in the valley. Sherry's auburn hair, highlighted red in the sunshine, cascaded over the wool blanket and onto his bare arm. Her tranquil expression reassured him as she slept. Her smooth white teeth and enthusiastic brown eyes made him question whether she had remembered her midnight confession. And she evidenced no qualms about lying on a porch swing with him as day broke over Los Angeles. Hi. She pulled back the blanket and stretched her arms upward. How far is it to Vegas? Well, I figure a little over three hours. She stood in her khaki shorts and top. Patch no longer saw the hurt schoolteacher jilted by the rock and roll singer. She had long legs and a perfect torso. So what do you think? Uh, about what? The whole thing. The money, Roselli, the job they want you to do. The question is, where was Moon chasing me from? There must have been a time lapse. I must have gone out and ended up next to the river. But if somebody threw you down there, Patch, you would have been bruised. Patch nodded. And who is Moon? Her brown eyes glowed in the morning light. Talk of the president stirs up something inside of you. And Cuba. Maybe I am government. If I did something for Rosselli and his friends, his friends are alive because of me. Your mission. Right, last night. They both turned toward the freeway traffic in the morning sunlight. The limo dream, figures inside the car. I heard gunfire in my dream from all sides. Then I awoke. That's weird, Patch. What about the park? The table where you worked? Patch shook his head and held her. I just don't know. It'll all come to you, Patch. She remained nestled in his arms. This whole thing, the money, Roselli, the job they want you to do. Tonight, we'll find out what this is all about when we get to Vegas.